And so today I'm going to continue on that, um, looking at the life of, of Daniel. And as you can remember, um, Daniel and his friends they were taken captive. They lived in exile. Um, they were forced to live in a far, foreign environment, a godless environment. And the book of Daniel is such a great case study that, um, and, and some lessons that we can learn from their lives in understanding how to live consecrated lives in a culture that is allowing so much mixture. And, you know, you don't have to be prophetic to look around you that we are living in a, in a culture that's allowing a lot of mixture um, and compromise into our um, understanding or an expression of, of our Christian faith. And one of the things that we look at last week, I'm just giving a recap for those of you who weren't here last week, um, but sometimes as Christians we live like there's only two options to live as a Christian. Um, there's only two options on the table. The one option is, well, I just I must only read Christian books. I must only read, um, watch Christian movies. I must only listen to Christian music. I must separate my children and homeschool them maybe, go and live on a mountain somewhere and just be... A, you know, set apart from all the filth and all the compromise and all the wickedness around me. <laughs> so, a lot of people live with that understanding, well, our job is to judge the world and to point out all the messes that's wrong with the world, but I can't contaminate myself with this. But how many of you know that if you want to be light amongst darkness, you can't remove light from a dark environment? If you want to be salt, in a contaminated environment, you need to be in that environment. So option A is like, I need to remove myself from it. I can't contaminate myself with this. And that's not really biblical. But then you have option B that says, well, I just need to blend in with culture. After all, it is culture. Everyone is sleeping around. Everyone is like, you know, if I have to get, if I... If, if I want to get ahead in life, I just need to compromise a little bit, cheat a little bit here, yeah, not be a little bit, um, not be honest in that area. And I need to blend into culture so that I can be relevant in culture. Everyone is vaping. Everyone is getting drunk. I still love Jesus, but I need to be relevant to my culture. And in the book of Daniel, God actually comes and says, you know what, there's an option C that I want you to live like. I actually want you to step into darkness. I want you to step into Babylon, into a godless environment, into an environment that is allowing the worship of so many other gods. And I want you to go and love that culture. I want you to go and serve that culture. Don't judge him, but I want you to be different. I want you to live in Babylon, but to be citizens of heaven. I want you to live in East London, in South Africa, but I want you to be citizens of heaven. I don't want you to be contaminated with the world. And that is how you're going to win the world. Not by judging it, but by loving and serving it and bringing light and truth in that environment. So, Daniel and his friends we looked last week that they resolved in their hearts that they were not going to defile themselves. And let's face it, it takes courage. It takes so much courage not to defile ourselves because it's unpopular. It goes against culture. Not to gossip when everyone is gossiping. Not to, not to defile your eyes with, with, with series and, and images on Netflix. Not to... Cancel other people. And we also discovered that one of the keys in Daniel and his friend's life, in order to live consecrated lives, we can't do it alone. You need consecrated people in your life. You need people who can go to war with you. You need people who can pray for you. People who can encourage you. People who can speak truth to you. Consecrated people also realize that it is not just about them. They realize that... Um, they live for something bigger than themselves. That's why it's not just about them and Jesus. It's not just about their expression of their faith. And, well, I'm just going to just cultivate my relationship with Jesus. 
but they also realize that my breakthrough will become other people's breakthrough. We see in all Daniel's dealings, it was never about his great gift and his great relationship with God, but everything that he did was to promote other people, not just his friends, but the community in which he lived. Even those people who were trying to cancel and murder them, even them went out of his way realizing that God loves everyone. And I can't just live for myself. I have to live for a bigger um, purpose than myself. So today we're going to jump into Daniel 3. Daniel 3. Open your Bibles to Daniel 3. Are you all good this morning? Are you ready? Daniel 3. I love this chapter. There's so much truth in this. So I've just... um, Took out a few points for us to remember this morning. So as we start with Daniel 3, we are learning that King Nebuchadnezzar, he makes a golden image of himself. And the Bible says it's about 30 meters high, about 3 meters wide. And he he erects this image and then he calls all the leaders, all the politicians, all the governors um, around for the dedication of this um, statue that he made. And then we read it, we discover that a decree, a decree is read out that at the sound of musical instruments, everyone needs to fall down and worship this idol. And if they don't, they will be thrown in a burning f- furnace. So we see that this King Nebuchadnezzar, he's quite a... I mean, he's quite gangster-like. I mean, last week, it's like, if, if he doesn't get his way, then I'm just going to chop you up. Not just you, your children, your family, everyone. And this week, he says, well, I'm not just going to do that. I'm going to throw you into a fire if you don't do what I tell you to do. That's the environment in which Daniel and his friends live. Now, let me just pause here for a moment. And I might state the obvious here, but it, I think sometimes it's not that obvious. The inspiration to build the image to yourself does not come from God. And I'll just to clarify this, I'm not talking about a statue that you built of yourself. Now, I know some of you may have got a statue of yourself in your backyard. Um... That's weird, but it's okay. What I'm talking about is a spirit in the world. The spirit in the world that compels us to self-promote, to, to self-promote, to image bold. What am I talking about? It's creating that perfect image on social media. Creating that, you know... <laughs> all the filters and, and I need to get so many likes on, on my social media feed. That spirit to self-promote, to image bold, is rampant in the world today. I mean, if you're familiar with the my body, my choice movement, it is my body, so therefore it is my choice whether I want to abort the child or not. It is my body. You can't tell me how I need to... to Manage my own life. It is my choice. That is self-promotion. That is image building. That is exactly the spirit that we are talking about here in Babylon. It is my choice if I want to identify as a donkey, a cat, a woman, or a, or a man. One of Joe's... One of the... <laughs> There was this boy in a school. He's not in a school anymore, but he came to school with a, with a, with a, a little necklace and he literally identif- started identifying as a cat. And he's wondering why all the kids are teasing him. This is true. <laughs> the culture of humanity is so self-focused. And there's this constant need to get validation from other people. And you see, if we don't know who we are, if you don't know who you are, you're going to seek validation in others. If you don't know who you are, then well, maybe I must identify as a woman if I'm a guy. Maybe I need to 
to, to identify someone else. Maybe I need to just try and build this image on social media so that people can, so I can get validation. That's the spirit of Babylon and the temptation is to bow its knee to it. And it is subtle, but don't take its bait. So when, if we, gonna, we're going to start reading in verse eight, Daniel 3 verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Again, you don't have to be prophetic to know that that's the reality today in which we live in. The anti-Semitism, the hatred of Jewish people. And I spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made the decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery. Anyone place a psaltery here? In sympathy with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the face of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, yes, what's, yes, what's interesting the mandate here was not worship the Babylonian gods instead of your god. Remember, they lived in a, in a pluralistic culture. In other words, they, the, 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 the worship of many gods was allowed. It's okay. You can worship Baal. You can worship money. You can worship sex. You can worship all these different gods and, um, and your own god. It wasn't exclusive. The mandate was you must worship the spirit of Babylon in addition to your God. Mixture. In other words, it is okay. You can be a Christian in this environment, but you also need to bow your knee a little bit to all these other things. See, that's what the enemy does. The enemy doesn't need you to deny your faith. The enemy doesn't want you to turn your back on Christianity, but if he can convince you just to bow your knee a little bit, just to tolerate a little bit of mixture, he has already won your heart. I want you to think about this. I actually went on a Google search. 85% of, Christ, uh, 85 of South Africans today identify themselves as Christian. 85 of South Africa says they are Christian. Now let me ask you, why do you think... why? then why is there so much crime in society? Why is South Africa recognized globally as the number one capital in the world when it comes to rape? I can tell you why. It's because of mixture. It's like I'm a Christian, but I also have my gods. I'm a Christian, but I also have my culture. I'm a Christian, but I just have to alive. If I don't do it, there's no way that I'm going to get a, a, a head in industry, in my, in my business, my field of influence. I remember during the elections, man, I was pumped. I did my research for, I've been following this particular part. In fact, I, I followed Action Essay. I loved Herman Mashaba. Man, the guy's on, he's a, he's a man of God. Every day he posts his, it's devotional on there. I love what their policy st stood for. And I was excited to listen to the uh, manifesto launch. At the manifesto launch, they bring up a traditional healer to come and dedicate the meeting to, to, um, um, to whoever. And I'm like, how can you be a Christian but allow that? Not just action S, I mean, ANC are known for that. You can be a Christian, but we also need to make room for our culture. We need to, to honor and offer to the ancestors. The D, 
uh, I mean, the EFF. You can be a Christian in this nation, but just allow a little bit. See, the devil doesn't want you to deny. He doesn't mind you say, he doesn't mind you turning your back on God. That's fine, as long as he can get you to allow a little bit of mixture. You can be a Christian, no problem. But you need to be sexual active to be relatable to others. You can be a Christian, no problem. But you need to also need to, to be a little bit greedy and be dishonest to make it in the marketplace. You can be a Christian, no problem. You don't have, don't have, you don't have to watch porn, but it's okay just to watch shows where there's nudity. It's okay. I'm going to turn, I'm, I'm not going to look at that. It's okay. You can be a Christian, but just use others to get ahead in the game. It's okay. You can be a Christian in this society, but you also need to honor your culture so that you don't offend anyone else. The spirit of the world wants you to bow your knee just a little bit to it. I can still love God. I can still come to church. I just have to give in a little bit to culture, to pressure. And so as the story goes on, we see here that King Nebuchadnezzar, he hears, he hears about this. He hears that there are some guys in his kingdom that are not bowing down to the image that he erected. And so he summons these guys, these Jews, to his palace, to his office, and he demands him, he says, listen, didn't I say that you have to bow down? I don't mind that you are Christians, that's fine. But I also need you to just respect and honor the culture. I want you to honor and respect this image that I've erected. And if you do it, then it's fine. I'm just going to overlook it. But if you don't do it, I'm going to throw you in, in the fire. So that is the backdrop to this morning's four lessons. So I'm going to give you four lessons of how do we stay consecrated in a society that's allowing so much contamination and, and, and mixture in society. So you've got, you've, got, you've got your pens and notebooks there. The first point is, consecrated people, let God defend them. That's my first point. Let God defend you. Verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Consecrated people are comfortable in letting God defend them. What is it in us that constantly need to defend ourselves? Is it just me? <laughs> okay, it's just me. We are driven by this urge as Christians to constantly, constantly explain ourselves, to defend ourselves. Man, I need to be so careful what I say to whom I say it, where am I saying it. I need to be so apologetic around unbelievers. Is it just me? I remember when I was a new baby Christian, I think I was a Christian for about three weeks, and I was, I was on fire as I am today. But I remember, man, I, so the one son I'm like, I, I invited my friend, my drinking buddy from previous time, good friend of mine, I invited him to church because if Jesus can do it to me, he can do it to my friend. And he needed to Jesus. So I invited him to church down in Cape Town. It was the evening service. Got there. And the next thing, the, the pastor says, all the young people, get up on the stage. We're just going to pray in tongues for the, I, I felt the Lord said, we're going to pray in tongues for the rest of the service. 
Now, I'm a, I'm a baby Christian. So I don't know anything about tongues. It is weird to me too. But right up there on the stage we are. Now, I got saved. I got radically saved in a barn, Cape Town. And then first church I got to was this colored church. And I love it. I mean, those are my spiritual parents, man. But I want to tell you, you've never been in a church until you've been in a, in a Cape Colored church. There's a lot of passion going along there. Those people love Jesus, and they're not shy about it. So we are literally, we are, I mean, we pack the stage out. I'm like, okay, and I mean, my friend, he's looking at me, and I'm like also nervous. And so we sit there, everyone's sitting on the stage, and like, everyone is just praying in tongues. I can't pray in tongues. I don't know, I don't know what it is. I've been a Christian for three weeks. All I can remember is like, Jesus Oh, my word. Please, please let my buddy John, please let him not get offended. Let him not get offended. Lord, I want to invite him back. He needs Jesus, but this is freaking me out. And I'm just, I'm literally, I, I don't pray in tongues, but I'm praying to Jesus so that my friend doesn't get offended. And in that moment, the Lord's saying, why are you praying? Why are you so afraid that you will get offended? That's a defense. You, it's just, a, it's just a, the, the fear of man. To invite him here, my job is to convict him of his sin. My job is to get him into a relationship with me. You just brought him well done. Stop apologizing for me. I'm big enough, I can defend myself. Why is there this urge in us always to be so to walk in shells around unbelievers? You know, you know what's the best way to live truth or to defend absolute truth? It's just to live it, just to demonstrate it. People who live out truth authentically and let God defend them is so much more powerful than those trying to use an argument to defend their faith. You want to hear another cool testimony? So two weeks, not yeah, two weeks ago, I was on a, on a Zoom call with some of our Bethel leaders, and so this one guy shared this testimony of a pastor in Afghanistan. Now, for those of you who don't know, in Afghanistan it is illegal to be a Christian. You can literally be, um, apart from being persecuted, you can you can they will you can die for your faith. And so this pastor has encountered during the night, and the Lord said to him. I want you to put a five-minute gospel presentation together with the details of where people can get Bibles and, and further information on Christianity. I, wanna, I, I want you to, to, to post it on YouTube. And so the guy does this, and this thing, the Lord just blows on this, and people are just responding to this gospel message. Over 500,000 people at the time in Lycian in a question of days gave their lives to Jesus, Afghan um, 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 Muslims, 500,000 Muslims. This thing just spreads to like wildfire. Um, they are contacting that number to get materials, to get Bibles. And so um, the Taliban got news of this. And one of the Taliban leaders, he got so furious that he summoned some of his, or, no, it was, it was Hamas. Um, other, I think it's Hamas. Hey, did I say Taliban? Yeah. Yeah, it was Taliban. So this leader, he got so furious that he got in his car and he was going to drive with his military band, his soldiers, to this village to find out where, where this guy is posting this stuff from and they're going to kill this pastor. So he drive through the desert en route to this pastor who's spreading the gospel they go through the desert, and the next thing, three guys on camels walk through the desert across the road, and they stop. These guys on the camels got up. This guy gets out of his car, and this one guy on a camel addresses him by name, and he says, so-and-so, um, why are you going to that pastor's house to kill him? You're not after him. You're not, def you're not defended at him. You are after me. I am Jesus. <laughs> the guy's freaked out. First of all, who told you I am? Who told me 
Who told you what my name is? Who told you what I'm about to do? Well, I'm Jesus, the guy says. So he says, well, if you are Jesus, then you better, if you heal my wife, then I will believe that it was you who is speaking to me now and I won't kill that man. So this guy's wife is lying in a hospital bed. She's scheduled to have her foot amputated. She's got gangrene and the guy shows some zo zoom. He shows us the before foot and the after foot. This lady's foot, it's gross, man. Uh, she's got a, a big toe and a little toe. In between, there's nothing. It's, it's a black hole. There's a black, like a gap in her ankle. She's about to have her ankle a amputated. So the guy says, if you are Jesus and you heal her, then I will follow you and I won't kill this guy. They got in the car, chased away, on their way still to go and kill this guy. En route to go and kill this guy, he gets a phone call from his wife saying, you don't know, you, you won't believe what just happened. I'm about to be pushed into for my operation and the next moment, something happened in my foot and my foot started to grow out and it's completely healed. And she sends him a a picture of a foot. This guy, this Taliban leader, gave his life to Jesus in that spot. Consecrated people are not ashamed of the gospel. They allow God to defend them. When we live truth, we don't have to argue it. We become the message. I think why a lot of unbelievers are getting so frustrated with the church and with believers is because we come with a lot of arguments. We put so much Christian content out there on social media and that's not going to win everyone over. What win people over is a demonstration of love. And that brings me to the second point. Consecrated people put their trust in God, not outcomes. Consecrated people put their trust in God, not outcomes. So we continue to read 10 verse 17. It says, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And He will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But now listen to this. But even if he does not, on a portion say, consecrated people have an even if not kind of faith. Even if he does not save us, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. What these boys are saying is, we know that God is powerful. We know that he is amazing. We think He's going to save us, but even if He does not save us, we will not dishonor Him. We will not compromise. And what they are saying is that our obedience to God is based not on Him doing something, but on who He is. I'm not consecrated so He can give me a good life. I'm not consecrated so He can bless me. I'm consecrated because I value my relationship with Him. And that's what holiness is. Holiness means to be, to, to be His regardless of what life presents to us. Even though it is costly. To love God. To be holy doesn't mean that you're going to be spared from suffering. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. We live in a world of pain and suffering. We live in a world of sin. And unfortunately, as Christians, we are not exempt from that. But what sets us apart, what makes us different from the rest of the world is when pain and suffering come, we don't walk through those valleys alone. What's that song? Even though I walk through, even, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
even though I walk through the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even though I have to suffer, I'm not going to fear, for I'm not alone. And friends, I've seen so many Christians. I've been there myself. We get hurt. We get disappointed by God because we hope that God would do certain things for us in a certain way. And in essence, our hope can't be in an outcome. Our hope needs to be in a person who never changes, who never forsakes us, who is always good. And one of the greatest gifts that you can give yourself is to let go of outcomes. God doesn't owe you anything. His sacrifice on the cross is enough proof that He cares. And so often, we demand that God do stuff for us and we get disappointed. Our faith gets rocked because the outcome is not what we anticipated it. And these guys are consecrated and says, even if God doesn't do it, we want you to know, King. You can throw us in a fire. We know that He can save us, but even if He doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that we will not compromise our relationship with Him. He is sovereign. He can do whatever He wants. It is a win-win for us. So as the story continues in verse 19, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious. Can you imagine? He was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards him changed. And he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual. And he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men firmly tied, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Now the story of these three men being thrown into the fire is such a powerful lesson for us around this whole concept of unjust suffering or injustices in the world. I want you to think for a moment just the context here. So we, we, you've got three young men here. They were from a racial minority group. They've been forcefully enslaved. They've been human trafficked. They're about to be murdered. I mean, every human right you can think of is being violated. There's so much injustice happening here. And see, so many people struggle with this concept. How can, God, how can I serve for God if this happens to me? How can you say God is good if all this suffering and all this injustice is happening to me. So many people suffer with this concept. So many people turn it back towards God because they see injustice. They see unjustful suffering and pain and persecution. It's like, well, if God is really so good, if He's so powerful, why didn't He come through for me? How many people have I heard, well, God didn't come through for me? Oh, God, if you don't come through for me, we put the mark on God. And maybe there's some of you that are struggling with that this morning. I mean, let's, let's be real. I, and again, I, you know, I'm like that at times. God, I'm doing all the right things. God, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Why am I still suffering? God, why, why, why did I lose my job? This guy is doing everything that is wrong. And he gets promoted. God, why am I getting sick? Why am I not getting healed? God, I'm being falsely accused. What are you going to do about it? You, I, no, God is not that good. Otherwise, he would have saved me. 
See, although we live in a fallen world, where sin has opened the door to so much, so many, so, so much suffering and injustices, I want to tell you that we are left with these two truths. Injustice and suffering will never have the final say. God came to rewrite injustice. He came to rewrite suffering and conquer death once and for all at the cross. And the second truth is, God will never allow you to go through that injustice or that suffering on your own. And that brings me to my third point this morning. Consecrated people know that they are never alone. Consecrated people know they are not alone. Verse 24, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that were tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, Certainly, Your Majesty. And he said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unarmed, and a fourth man looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Boy, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and as satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors um, crowded around them, and I saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of the heads um, signed. The, the robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. I love what it says. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unarmed, and a fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now this king was a wicked king. He believed in a lot of different gods. But he didn't realize that this wasn't just any god that he was seeing in the middle of that fire. This was the son of man. This was Jesus. This was our defender. This was the, the, the general of, of angel armies. Our savior, our king. This was Jesus, Emmanuel. I am with you. And Jesus, Emmanuel, with us promised that you will never be alone in your suffering and in your injustice. He will always be there to comfort you. He will always be there to defend you in the midst of whatever fire we are facing. Jesus conquered death and hell, death and, hell and he said, I will never leave you. I see the injustice happening to you right now. I see your suffering, but I'm in this fire with you. And then it says here, they were unbound and unharmed. I don't know why sometimes we have to go through these moments. We're going to talk about it in a moment. But Jesus is saying that in that suffering, and in that pain, in that injustice, I don't want you to walk tied up. I don't want you to be bound to a fear. I don't want you to be bound to a hopelessness. I don't want you to be bound with despair and a victim mentality. And I know this is, this is, this is hard what you're going through. But I can untie you. I can untie you from fear. I can untie you from hopelessness. And Jesus teaches us that in these moments, we can live free from all these things. So we can actually walk in, in, a, in the midst of injustice, in the midst of pain, with peace, with hope, with the comfort of His presence. So in the midst of me preparing this word that I thought I have a revelation of this week, <laughs> I had to go to the doctor. I had some stuff going on in my body and I took some blood samples. 
And the doctor phoned me a couple of days later. This was in this week. And said, Kone, your cholesterol is fine. Your blood pressure is fine. Man, your kidneys is fine. Going, yeah, yeah, ticking all the boxes, ticking all the boxes. But there's one result that came back. It's not looking so good. And we need to do, you need to come and give another blood sample. We need to send it up to Pretoria, to the lab there. And the doctor comes back and says, one of your blood counts is way off charge. And you got this incurable condition that you'll have to take chronic medication for the rest of your life. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, I'm in the fire. And encouragement comes, and despondency comes. <laughs> and while I'm sitting there with myself, feeling the heat, I get an email from SARS. <laughs> and that is after Tuesday and staff meeting, the net tells us how SARS blessed them with an ma amazing rebate and we celebrated this, that testimony. Although my testimony wasn't that SARS is giving me money, my testimony is that I owe SARS six and a half thousand rand. And I'm just... I'm like, I'm just, I'm just feeling despondent. And Jesus says, I see all of this. But can I, I can untie you of fear right now. I can untie you of feeling despondent and discouraged. And I just, I just got in a word. I just start reading over all my promises. <laughs> Usually what I do is I, I, I jump. In moments like that, I jump into the Psalms and I just got heaven's perspective again. I just allowed him. Just said, Lord, I'm bound with fear right now. Just cut me loose. <laughs> I'm walking in this fire. I don't know why. This is, I don't want to be on chronic medication from a condition that they say is curable. Cut me loose. Cut me loose from... And he did that. And you know what? It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. I love it. It says they didn't even smell like fear, or like fire. I don't know. Again, I don't know your story. But I do know some of you are facing injustices right now. There's some pain, suffering in your life. But I want to tell you that Jesus, if you look, you will see Jesus in that fire. And here's a place where you can live where you will not reek of the smell of fear or the smell, the stench of hopelessness or despair. Jesus will either free you from that fire or he will be in that fire with you or walk you through that fire. Injustice never has a final say. Suffering never has a final say. But look for Jesus in those moments. Look for Jesus in those moments. You don't have to suffer alone. And then I'm coming to my last final point. Let's just read there from verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be the God of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I've said those three names probably 20 times over the last two weeks, and I still struggle. To say it just and I'm not getting any help from any of you all. <laughs> who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up the life oh my word. And it's just incredible. They trusted in him and defiled the king's command and were willing. They were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of these three men be cut into, yes, the guy again, cut into pieces, fire cut into pieces. Everyone who don't serve their God will be cut into pieces. I mean, that's going to be, I mean, <laughs> unless you become a Christian, you're going to be cut into pieces. 
to be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other god can save in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And here's a final point. There's always promotion on the other side. There is promotion on the other side. See, many times we are fearful of the furnace. But not only is God in the furnace with you, walking with us, but there's promotion on the other side. I don't understand it. I don't like preaching about it. I don't fully grasp it. I don't like it, but it's true. In Romans 8, it says, those who, those who will identify with Him in His suffering will also join with Him in His glory. And I've seen it so many times. I've seen it in my own life. If you can find Jesus in the middle of the fire or the trial that you're going through, you will also share in His glory eventually. And yes, the irony, we think that promotion comes from compromise. We think that comprom like promotion comes from, man, the economy is just too, it's just, things are just too tight. I can't tithe anymore. But promotion comes from those who are not willing to compromise. Promotion comes from those who says, I am not willing to compromise the standard of being Union with God. I'm not going to lower it. I'm not going to compromise my witness. Consecrated people trust God and find Him in all things. Consecrate yourself, people, for God is about to do mighty things among us. Amen.